Hello everyone, my name is Elizabeth Sanders and I'm going to be presenting Research Hacks for Faculty. Before we begin, I wanted to make a couple of general notes. First, research is a cyclical process, it's not a linear one. So even though we'll be discussing this in a systematic way, keep in mind that revisiting steps and making revisions along the way is expected. Second, research is also an emotional process. When it's going well, you may feel excited or energized, but when it's going poorly, you probably feel frustrated and tired. You should expect to experience both sets of emotions at different times. When it is going poorly, remember, the library is here to help. The main meat of our presentation today is going to focus on planning a search strategy. You can think of this as kind of like a road map of your research. Some of these may be things you already do. Some of them may be things you never thought to do. The general steps of planning a search strategy are identifying keywords, identifying places to search, creating search phrases, using search tools like filters and permalinks, and keeping track of both your searches and your sources. The first step of any research should be identifying the keywords. Keywords are the most important words that define your research topic or research question. We usually tell freshmen to think of them as the nouns of their research question. These would also include synonyms or related topics. For example, if I was doing research on Native American heritage, American Indians is another way of saying Native American. A related topic might be a specific tribe or a specific incident that happened in Native American history. Things you can say multiple ways like effectiveness, pro, con, strength, weakness, don't really make great keywords. There's just too many variations of how people talk about those. Keep in mind that these are not static. You may start your search with certain keywords and then adjust them as you continue during the research process. For example, if you find a couple of good sources that are using a different way of discussing one of your main ideas, you might switch out your original keyword for the one that those sources are using. Here's an example of identifying keywords. My topic is including accessibility when designing online courses. The keywords would be accessibility, designing, and online courses. Including would not make a good keyword. If a source discusses all three of the other keywords, it's going to naturally discuss inclusion, even if it doesn't use that exact word. Some of my synonyms and related topics are instructional design, universal design, and inclusive design. All of these combine the ideas of design and teaching or design and inclusivity or accessibility. Another set of synonyms would be virtual, digital, and online. These are different words, but they refer really to the same topic. Now you try. Pause the video and take one minute to write down some keywords related to your research. Once you have your keywords, the next step would be identifying places to search. These could be based on discipline, types of sources needed, and desired scope. Here at the library, we have many subject-specific databases. If you're interested in searching within a specific discipline, like business or nursing, then using the subject-specific databases can help you do that. Some frequently used databases for literature reviews are Web of Science, Cochrane, and PubMed. Web of Science is useful not only for locating articles, but also for seeing which have cited that article. So if you find a really good article and you want to see if anyone else has built upon their work, you can use Web of Science to do that. Cochrane is a medical database that's really helpful for systematic reviews. PubMed is a government database run out of the National Library of Medicine. While it is useful for medical research, it's also useful for social science, psychology, and other similar types of research. For larger scope, you can consider adding one of the following three resources. WorldCat is a database that allows you to search the holdings of many libraries, both nationally and internationally. This can be useful if you're trying to locate a rare material, government information, or to see if there are any books published on your topic. Dissertations and Theses is a database that lets you search through master's and doctoral theses and dissertations. While these are not normally published in a book or a journal, 
they may still be really helpful, particularly for your literature review. The federal government has various government databases available to you. I mentioned PubMed, but another example would be ERIC, which is an education-specific database. Government databases are really useful for locating gray literature, like research reports or technical reports. Here's an example of identifying places to search. The discipline for my topic was education. I wanted books, periodical articles, probably scholarly journal or trade articles, and government sources. For my scope, I didn't want anything too in-depth. I mostly wanted resources to learn more about the topic and maybe see ways to apply them to my own classes. For places to search, I included the education subject databases from our library, the Sims Library Catalog, which has both books and government sources. Our library is part of the Federal Depository Library Program, so we have access to both print and online government sources through our catalog. I also wanted to search USA.gov, which is a search engine for government websites, and the Federal Department of Education. Now you try. Pause the video and take one minute to jot down some ideas of places you might search. Creating search phrases is probably the hardest part of your research process. Search phrase just means how you combine your keywords with various tools in a search box. Search phrases can be simple, but they can also be complex depending on the nature of your research. Just like your keywords, your search phrases are frequently revised as you search. How you search also differs between search engines and databases. Search engines like Google or DuckDuckGo are designed for natural language searching, they're a little bit fuzzier. You don't have to be as precise. Formal databases like we have here at the library, though, are designed with a structured language. They're much more precise. To search them well, you need to use specific tools. Some of the tools that we're going to talk about do work in search engines, though less precisely. All the linked advanced search pages explain which tools work in their system and how to use them. To combine our keywords, there are four main tools. In full disclosure, you may not use all of these in your own searching. It's also not fair to expect yourself to be an expert with them. If you are struggling to make search phrases or to locate sources, please contact a librarian. We may not know much about your topic, but we are familiar with how to search databases. Collaborating together, we can get a search that will work well. The Boolean operators AND, OR, and NOT are used in order to connect your keywords. These are probably the most important tool in the library databases. They can be a little confusing at first because they don't work the way we speak. For example, in real life, if I went through the drive through and I asked for a burger and a shake and fries, I would get more items every time I added an AND. But in the database, AND actually reduces your results. The more ANDs you add, the fewer sources you will have. That's because AND means all of the words you mention have to be included. If we go back to my burger, shake, and fries metaphor, the only thing that a database would return if I did that would be a smoothie with all of those mixed together. Or broadens your results to those mentioning either word. Not excludes a particular word. One trick when thinking of how to apply these is to think about the relationship of your keywords. If they are two very different ideas and you want both to be included, that's a good place for an AND. If it's a synonym where if only one is okay, then that's where an OR would be useful. NOT is probably the one you'll use the least, but if you are in a research topic where a lot of people are discussing one angle and you definitely do not want that angle, that might be where you use it. Nesting means to use parentheses. These are to organize the search when combining two different Boolean operators, normally when you combined AND and OR. Just like with order of operations, anything that you put in the parentheses will be searched first. This is really important when you're using OR, but it might not be obvious why. So let's look at an actual database for an example. My search here has a synonym online or virtual or digital. I want at least one of these words as well as the topic of accessibility. When I make this search, I have over a million results. The reason is the way it's structured. Right now, the database is reading from left to right literally. 
So it's finding anything that mentions online, whether or not it mentions accessibility, anything that mentions virtual, whether or not it mentions accessibility, or anything that mentions both digital and accessibility. Let's look at how our results change when I add in the nesting. I will put one parenthesis, the closing one, after digital, and the initial parenthesis in front of online. This changes the search so that now the database will look for any that have at least one of these words and then narrow it down to only those that also mention accessibility. That dropped my results from over a million to a little bit over 8,500. You can see where that could make a big difference in how you do your searches. There are other tools I could still use to get this number even lower. But for now, I just wanted to show you why the nesting was important. Phrase searching allows you to search for exact phrases. You do that by putting quotation marks around the phrase. This is most useful when you have something that's only talked about in a particular way. For example, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder would be a phrase. Truncation uses the asterisk or some other symbol in order to indicate you want multiple endings of words. This one can be a little tricky, but it's often useful when you have a word that has the same meaning, but very slightly. In my search, for example, design, whether it's designing, designer, designs, or just design, would be useful to my results. That's where truncation might be helpful. I know that this is a very technical topic, so I wanted to look at both some poor examples and then some better examples. The first search phrase, how do I design accessible materials for online courses, would work just fine for a search engine, but not a library database. It's not combined in a way that the database understands. Designing accessible materials for online course is better, because now we've at least isolated it to just the keywords. Again, this would be fine for search engines, but a database would really struggle. It still doesn't really understand how you're combining these words together. Education and universal design or inclusive design is pretty good. It uses and, it also uses or, and we've used some phrase searching in order to get those exclusive ideas. But as we saw in the demonstration just now, if we don't have the nesting, which is the parentheses around the words connected with or, it's not going to combine them in the way that we want. The last one, learning management system, where the truncation symbol is inside of the quotation mark, also doesn't work. Truncation inside of phrase searching just cancels out. If you wanted to include truncation with system, we could, but we'd have to redesign how the search looks. Now here are some better examples. On the left for subscription databases, and on the right for search engines. You can see that some of these on the subscription database side are pretty complex. Yours may not be this complex, and that's okay. You don't always need a complex search. Most importantly, you should do what you are comfortable with. If you do find that you need more help with the search, you can always contact a librarian. One thing I want to note about the search engine's good examples is that they're very clear about their keywords, and you can also use the ones on the left that we designed for specific databases. As I mentioned earlier, many search engines can use similar features like the Boolean operator AND and phrase searching, though sometimes they are less precise or they might use slightly different symbols. Now you try. Pause the video and take one minute to draft at least one search phrase combining your keywords we identified earlier. There are some additional search tools that could help you, but they don't go in the search box. Limiters, or filters, allow you to specify some particular aspect of a search. If you've ever done any online shopping, you've used these before. For example, if I filter to just shoes, just black, and just on sale, I'm using filters in the same way that the library database does. They just filter using different parameters. Some useful filters that are available in most databases are the following. Date or publication date. This allows you to specify the time frame of publications. Language lets you specify the language of the publication. The databases do index international publications, so if you only speak one language or if you speak several, you can make sure that you're getting ones you can actually read. Peer-reviewed allows you to specify only peer-reviewed publications, though admittedly sometimes this one's not perfect. Full text lets you filter to only those that Sims Library has the full text of. I don't usually recommend full text for faculty, 
because you may have sources that you need that we don't have here at SIMS. A little later in the presentation, we'll talk about some ways you could get those. Many of these filters are also available through Google Scholar, the advanced searches of other search engines, and many government databases. We'll go back to my search example so that I can show you what some of these look like. Because I've already completed a search, my tools are going to be on the left-hand side of the screen. You can find many of these same filters underneath the search boxes from the initial search screen. I'm going to specify I only want peer-reviewed. Not only has my result number changed, you can see here under current search, the limiter is listed. So now I know exactly what I've put. For publication date, let's say I only want the last 10 years. In that first box, from, I'm going to put 2012 and hit enter. Again, you can see that my number of results has changed and I have another limiter added here. I'm going to select a language and then English because that's the only language I read fluently. I can read a little French, but not anything else. If I wanted to add full text, I could also do that. But again, for faculty, I usually don't recommend this, just because I know there are ways we can get you the source, even if we don't have it here in our library. Other useful search tools include permalinks and DOIs. Permalinks are the static URL to an item in the database. Depending on the database you're using, you may see this as stable URL or document URL. To understand why the permalink is important, you kind of have to look at how databases work. So let's go back to our example screen again. Let's say I'm really interested in this article, Lessons from the Pandemic, Congress Must Act to Mandate Digital Accessibility for the Disabled Community. We're so used to just copying and pasting the URL from this bar at the top to get back to a resource. But in a database, it doesn't work that way. Every time you search a database, it's a new instance. So if I close out of this tab, and paste that URL that I grabbed from the top, it's not going to be able to take me back to the resource. The instance that I was using that database is now gone. So what do I do? If you look on the right hand side of the screen in the tools menu, one of the tools at the very bottom is the permalink. This permalink will allow me to come directly back to this article in the database. If I'm off campus, I'll still need to log in, but I'll be able to use it. You'll know it's the permalink, especially because it'll have this little easyproxy.seclu. That is what specifies it's through our campus. This particular article also has a DOI, so I would probably copy and paste that into an email or a Google Doc for myself as well. DOI is short for Digital Object Identifier. The goal of the DOI is to form an interoperable persistent link. This is a fancy way of saying that as long as you know the DOI, you should be able to find the bibliographic information about your source through that DOI. It will not differ from database to database. That being said, you may need database access to read the full text of an item. Some citation formats, like APA, also want you to include the DOI as part of the citation if one is available. The important thing to remember about both permalinks and DOIs is that they will enable you to find that article or source again. Finally, one search tool you can use in databases that you cannot use in search engines is something called controlled vocabulary. Controlled vocabulary is the standard form that a particular database uses in order to index all information on that topic. You can see these as subjects, subject terms, mesh, which is short for medical subject headings, and or descriptors. What they're called in each database is a little different. There's two ways that you can locate these. The way that I suggest is actually to look at the sources that are relevant to your needs. If you have three sources or more that share a particular subject term, that's probably worth noting, either to change your search or to do a subject search. Each individual database will also have a thesaurus. You can search the thesaurus for a particular topic to see what word the database uses for it. Let's take a look using our current example. For this particular article, there are no subject terms listed. So if I wanted to find out what the subject term was, I would have to look at other sources, or I could use the subject terms that are linked up here. Clicking on subject terms took me to the thesaurus, so now I could search any word that is my keyword to see if they have a subject 
and if they do, what that subject might be. This article, Assistive Technology and Software to Support Accessibility, does have several subject terms, such as computer software, digital libraries, assistive technology, and access to information. For my particular search, assistive technology might be really important to me. Since I'm looking at online courses, maybe there's an assistive technology that I could put into Moodle. As a librarian, access to information, online information sources, and library public services would also spark my interest. A key component of your search strategy is going to keep track of both your searches and your sources. Most people keep track of their sources, but not necessarily their searches. If you keep track of your searches, you get a couple of benefits. The first one is you will always know where you've already searched and what you've already tried. If you have to put your research aside for a little bit, coming back to a list of what you've searched and where you've searched can help you from repeating old effort. It also helps if you have trouble locating a source again. Let's say that I have a government report, but the URL of that government report has changed. If I know what I searched to initially find it, then I should be able to find it again. The old school way of doing this would be to have a dedicated notebook or legal pad or to use word processing software and folders on your computer. You could also make use of Google Drive. All faculty members have Google Drive via their Southeastern email address. Google Docs offer word processing, while Google Sheets offer spreadsheet processing. The benefit of Google Drive is that you can edit the resources in it anywhere, as long as you're logged in and you have internet access. You can't bring your computer files with you everywhere, but you can bring your Google Docs with you everywhere. There is also specific reference manager software that you may find useful. The library has a subscription through EndNote Basic, but there are other services as well, like Evernote, OneNote, and Zotero. There's more information about these reference manager applications at our faculty research guide. Our faculty research guide is meant to help you locate tools and services to assist with your research. On the Home tab, you can find a couple of videos that introduce the library, information about how to contact a librarian, and some quick links such as getting online access help, logging into your library account, or logging into ILLiad, which is our interlibrary loan service. Speaking of interlibrary loan, the Help Obtaining Sources tab has further information on that service. The interlibrary loan service lets you request materials that you need for your research at no additional cost. You do have to create an ILLiad account, but the interlibrary loan research guide will walk you step by step through the process. You can also apply for a Lewis Reciprocal Borrowing Card. This card allows you to check out materials from participating Louisiana academic libraries. On the Literature Review tab, there's more information about those reference managers I spoke of. EndNote Basic is the only one that we have to the library, but we also have information to help you decide if any of these other applications would be useful to you. This page also has some tips for combining keywords, some databases that may be helpful to your literature review, and some books to help you write your literature review. The other tabs feature resources on particular avenues, such as writing, publishing, and grant and research proposal. The Grant and Research Proposal Resources tab features information on both state and federal grants as well as research proposal writing resources. The Research Help for Faculty is a three-minute video that walks you through the Faculty Research Guide. The overview of the library website video is about five minutes and explains what each tab of our library homepage does. The 10 Things You Must Know About Sims Library video is about eight minutes. It introduces several tools and services we offer. If you ever need help, there are several ways that you can contact a librarian. We have a 24-7 chat service that is staffed even if we're not in the building. The chat service is very useful if you're trying to decide on keywords, build search phrases, or decide which database to use. If there's ever anything that the chat service cannot cover, they will forward us an email so that we can follow up with you individually. If you're having technical problems, phone is especially good because we can walk you through different troubleshooting mechanisms. Email is best for more in-depth research that can wait a little bit. For example, we recently had a faculty member who wanted to request 20 different articles from Interlibrary Loan. They emailed us to first ask if that was possible, and if so, how to do it. We explained that while you can have 20 articles requested via Interlibrary Loan at one time, you can only enter five requests a day. 
We also offered to check our databases and library holdings to make sure we didn't have the article available before they submitted the interlibrary loan requests. When we checked, we found that we actually had access to many articles. That allowed the faculty member to get the articles they wanted quicker and also to only use interlibrary loan for the ones that were really needed. You are always welcome to come in person to the reference desk. We know everyone's busy, so we also offer research consultation service or RCS appointments. RCS appointments are one-on-one -on -one meetings with a librarian. You tell us what days and times work best for you, a little bit about your research and what you've already tried, and then the librarian who meets with you does a little investigation. These RCS appointments are usually about 30 minutes but they can be longer as needed. You can also schedule follow-up appointments as needed. I've done several of these with nursing faculty members who were writing literature reviews. You can make an appointment either through email or using our online form. Most importantly, remember that you can always contact us. I've provided both the information for the reference department and my personal information. I hope today's presentation was helpful. If we can be of any further help here in the library, please don't hesitate to ask.